In June 1996, I delivered a message to an audience in Northern Virginia about then Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich. I offered a brief history about Mr. Gingrich and his political performance based on his voting record and public statements. I then predicted that under his leadership there would be no rollback of the enormous growth of federal government. Sadly, many well-meaning conservatives across the country continued to cheer his rhetoric despite the fact that his actions clearly demonstrated that he was no friend of limited government under the Constitution. In the late 1990s, House Speaker Gingrich stepped down from his position and faded somewhat from the limelight. Recently, however, there has been a resurgence in voter outrage across the country over an out-of-control government. It developed because of a number of bailouts and a further nationalization of our already over-regulated economy. And just as in the early 1990s, Newt Gingrich is back in the news and is positioning himself to take advantage of voter backlash. Who is Newt Gingrich and what does he stand for? In this video presentation, we go back to our 1996 analysis and offer some up-to-date comments about his reemergence as a national leader. I begin by contrasting the Gingrich performance of 15 years ago with that of another congressman from Georgia, Dr. Larry McDonald. It was in 1974 that the late Larry McDonald won his seat in Congress as a Democrat. To him, being a Democrat or a Republican mattered little because he believed the basic standard for any American should be the Constitution of the United States. He never intended to take his direction from a speaker or a party leader if it conflicted. His commitment was to the Constitution. Once in office, McDonald quickly demonstrated that he would keep the promise he had made to the voters, that he would be guided solely by the document to which he'd sworn a solemn oath. He also became a significant force leading other congressmen from both political parties to do likewise. In 1978, four years after McDonald won his seat in the House, the people of Georgia elected Newt Gingrich, a Republican, as the congressman from a nearby district. Reputed to be a strict conservative, he was the first Republican from Georgia to serve in the Congress in the 20th century. Let's take a look at the Gingrich performance right from his earliest days in Congress. The September 19, 1979 Constitution-based Conservative Index shows McDonald with a 100% score and Gingrich with only 80%. Gingrich earned deficient marks in this rating period for voting for the creation of a Department of Education and for designating 68 million acres of mineral-rich land in Alaska as a federally protected wilderness. McDonald correctly maintained that there is no authorization in the U.S. Constitution for federal involvement in education. He also knew that a former leader of the American Communist Party named William Z. Foster called for a federal department of education by name in his 1932 book, Toward Soviet America. Among the elementary measures the American Soviet government will adopt to further the cultural revolution are a National Department of Education. The studies will be revolutionized, being cleansed of religious, patriotic, and other features of the bourgeois ideology. The students will be taught on the basis of Marxian dialectical materialism, internationalism, and the general ethics of the new socialist society. The measure creating the De Federal Department of Education passed in the House by 210 to 206. A shift of three votes, therefore, would have defeated it. Ever since its creation, educational standards in America have plummeted. But Gingrich voted for something that the Constitution doesn't permit and the Communist wanted. And he wasn't alone because the Department of Education was also eagerly sought by then-President Jimmy Carter. Regarding the Gingrich vote for locking up huge portions of the state of Alaska, we see again that the Constitution contains no authorization for federal land control. But there is an explicit call for land control in the very first of the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. The famous document crafted by Marx and Engels in 1848 calls for abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. The way our nation is being run, all land will soon be owned or controlled by the federal government. 
Marx wanted land control, a progressive income tax, termination of the rights of inheritance, a central bank, which is precisely what the Federal Reserve is, and government control of education. There are even explicit attacks in the manifesto on private property, the family, marriage, and homeschooling. The federal land grab should have been stopped years ago, but it wasn't. And it continues to the point where huge percentages of the territory of each of the 13 western states is now federally owned. The April 9, 1980 conservative index again shows McDonald with a perfect 100% score and Gingrich with supporting the grant of most favored nation status to communist China. Most favored nation status for communist China has enabled the tyrants who run that nation to flood America with slave labor goods, steal American jobs, and build up the treasury of the most murderous regime the world has ever seen. In the 13 years since I delivered that speech, the flight of American jobs to China only increased. And according to a first quarter 2009 Department of Treasury report, China has become the world's largest holder of U.S. debt, about $800 billion worth. Press reports from late 2008 and early 2009 revealed that Chinese officials are nervous about the amount of U.S. debt that they hold. Because of that, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton recently traveled to China to implore Chinese officials to continue propping up the dollar. All of this dependence on China started nearly three decades ago when the U.S. Congress granted China most favored nation status and Newt Gingrich voted for it. The people of Georgia thought that they had elected a stalwart anti-communist and conservative in Gingrich. But this was another early indication that they had not. There would be plenty more. It is also important to realize that dozens of congressmen had the same 100% score as McDonald during these rating periods. Gingrich would later vote to supply funds to promote trade with the Soviets, to transfer 2.2 million acres in Idaho to federal wilderness status, to arrange for federally funded loan guarantees to facilitate greater trade with Red China, to make taxpayer funds available to foreign governments through the Export-Import Bank, to grant amnesty to illegal immigrants, and to continue the costly monstrosity known as foreign aid. Gingrich did cast some votes that any constitutionalist could support, but the specific votes I have mentioned are those which clearly separated the Constitution's men from the establishment's boys. There were many more votes of this variety. For example, in 1994, before he became Speaker, Gingrich voted for funding for the National Endowment for the Arts, for an extra $1.2 billion for UN peacekeeping, for a presidential line item veto, for $13 billion in foreign aid, and for $166 million more dollars for the IRS. In 1995, he voted for $31.8 billion in foreign aid, but could not bring himself to vote in a different bill to cut foreign aid by a measly 1%. From the earliest days in Congress, Gingrich was never the hardcore conservative enemy of the establishment's drive for big government, even world government. I recall asking Larry McDonald about Gingrich 15 years ago. The prompt response I received was his assessment that Gingrich couldn't be trusted, was extremely ambitious, and would compromise principles whenever doing so would advance his own career. McDonald considered him a candidate for membership in the establishment that is leading our nation away from its foundations and into central control. Newt Gingrich is now touted as the leader of the conservative movement supposedly the much-needed alternative to Bill Clinton and the forces of big government. Time magazine named him Man of the Year and called him exceptional, brilliant, amazing. The magazine even characterized him as the key individual who will arrange to have, quote, power flowing out of Washington devolved